And the reason I was interested is I couldn't understand how every other part of the body would heal itself, but our eyes wouldn't. If we broke a leg and we had to wear crutches, no one wears crutches for the rest of their life. But yet when we receive glasses, we not only keep wearing them, but we keep wearing stronger ones. Hey guys, today our guest is a person who I deeply respect for his wonderful teachings. He is Dr. Jacob Lieberman. Dr. Lieberman has a doctorate in optometry and a PhD in vision science. He also has an honorary doctorate in science for his pioneering work in the field of light and color. He received H.R. Spittler Award for his groundbreaking contributions uh, to the field of phototherapy and he also received 2019 International Light Association's uh, Francis McMenamin Award uh, for his achievement in light medicine. He is praised by world-renowned thought leaders like Deepak Chopra, Bruce Lipton, Eckhart Tolle and uh, so on, including late Louis Hay, who said that Dr. Lieberman is one of her favorite teachers. He is also one of the pioneer to say that vision is not only the matter of physical thing, but it is a matter that has uh, a mental dimension. So I am very honored to welcome Dr. Jacob Lieberman. Hi, Jacob Lieberman. Thanks for coming to the show. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And, uh, you know, you just said something very interesting. You said that vision has a mental component. The part of vision that sees is the spiritual component. It is the spiritual component that we call awareness, pure awareness, which some people call consciousness, which is that which notices all that is. It not only notices all that is, but it notices all that is from everywhere at the same time. It knows everything, it sees everything, and it is everywhere. The only thing that we know that is that is what we call God, is what we call consciousness. And so perhaps the process of Uncovering the source of our seeing is the process of discovering godliness. What is godliness? Where does it reside? And does it ever leave us? Or is it in fact who we are at the most fundamental level? So I think these are very important aspects uh, of my work uh, or of my direct experience, uh, which perhaps we will, will get into in our conversations today. Absolutely, uh, Jacob. Before we go into the interview, Jacob has uh, written four bestsellers, including uh, Take Off Your Glasses and See and Luminous Life, which literally changed my life. So I wanted to say that before we go into the interview. And uh, Jacob, uh, where can people find you? Uh, right here with you. <laughs> um, they can find me on my website, which is jacoblieberman.org, O-R-G, and Lieberman is spelled L-I-B as in boy, E-R-M-A-N. They can follow me on our Facebook page, and that's essentially where I am. And uh, if they come to Maui, Hawaii, that's where I live. Awesome, Jacob. So, jo Jacob, I really want to uh, make sure that audience understand this. In 1976, you had a spontaneous rem remission of your nearsightedness, right? Can you share that yes. experience with our audience? Yeah. Um, in 1976, I had been practicing as an eye doctor for three years. I had been wearing glasses for about nine and a half years. And like yourself, I was nearsighted 
and I had a lot of astigmatism. And so I wore my glasses all the time, like you do, for seeing, for driving. My driver's license said I had to wear it. And because I was very interested in the possibility of how we can improve our vision naturally. And the reason I was interested is I couldn't understand how every other part of the body would heal itself, but our eyes wouldn't. If we broke a leg and we had to wear crutches, no one wears crutches for the rest of their life. But yet when we receive glasses, we not only keep wearing them, but we keep wearing stronger ones. And so for me, I was trying to see, is there anything that I could do with my patients that would help them to regain their natural eyesight or be able to prevent the deterioration of their vision to begin with? And so I was experimenting, not only with my patients, but I was the primary patient I was experimenting with. And so I was doing things like removing my glasses when I didn't need them, not eating with them, not wearing them inside the house, uh, giving myself weaker prescriptions, meditating, doing vision exercises, taking vitamins, dietary changes, all kinds of things. Everything seemed to help a certain degree, but I found that I couldn't seem to get beyond a certain point. And it was as if nothing I did could make the shift. And then one day uh, while I was sitting in meditation with my glasses off and my eyes closed, I had a profound internal vision. I became aware of myself and the room I was sitting in. And it was as though I, but I didn't know who the I was, was seeing myself and everything in the room and the view that I was seeing was crystal clear. It was not only crystal clear, it was optically scintillating. It was alive. And beyond that, it wasn't just optically clear. Everything was clear. Now, you know, our mind is very active most of the time because we have questions. The re what we have questions about are things that are not clear. But when you have an instance of total clarity, what we call mind disappears. And so it was an instance of that. At the time, I didn't know what it was, but looking back, I can now see it from a different place. So there was a moment of instant clarity and whatever was noticing seemed to be noticing from every point in space simultaneously. When I completed this meditative experience and opened my eyes to my amazement, the room and everything in it was crystal clear. And at first, I wasn't quite sure what had happened. I wasn't sure whether I was in a dream or I was actually awake. But after a couple of minutes where this clarity remained, then I started getting worried. Is something wrong? This is not supposed to happen. So one end of the scale, it's, oh my God, what happened here? It's a miracle. And the other one is, I must have a tumor or something because something is terribly wrong. So I got into my car and drove myself to my office without my glasses on. 
and everything was crystal clear. The street signs, the license plates, the billboards, everything. I got into the office. I sat in the examination chair 20 feet away from my eye chart. I started changing from one eye chart to the next. And I could consistently see 300% clearer, one line better than the 2020 line. And I thought that was amazing, but how could something like that occur? So I sat myself behind the instrument where we checked the vision and I put in some blurry lenses. So at the beginning I couldn't see anything and then I gradually changed the lenses even though I couldn't see what I was doing until I came to the perfect clarity, the same thing I would do with a patient. And when I finished the process for each eye and even balanced the vision in both eyes, I came out from behind the instrument and my initial thought is, wow, if I'm seeing 300% better, maybe my prescription disappeared. Maybe the optical measurements of my eyes don't exist anymore, or maybe it's much weaker. That's what I thought. If anything could happen, it must be that. But when I came out from behind the instrument and I looked at the instrument, the prescription in the instrument was almost identical to what was in my glasses. And I sat there astonished. How could my ability to read have improved 300% with no change to the optical measurements of my eyes? And then within a short time, I had the realization that the only way that could occur is if the seeing mechanism is not the eyes, is something beyond that. I then spent the next four years trying to figure out what occurred. Uh, that period of time between 1976 and 1980, I called an experiment on the workings of the mind. I was trying to figure out, is there a button? Is there something I can access in this thing called mind, which I was sure was in the head at the time, that could allow me to clearly explain what someone else would do so that they could have a similar experience? Well, I never discovered such a button. If an experience like that would occur for five minutes, you would say, oh my God, that's a miracle. If it occurred for a day, you would say, wait a minute, how can this possibly be? But now it has remained for 44 years. I'm 72 and a half years old. I have never worn glasses since that day for far away or even for reading. And I spent the day working on a computer and it doesn't seem to be getting worse. It remains the same or it gets better. So this is what I've learned. There is something that is the source of our essence. Uh, the great Indian sage Ramana Maharshi referred to it as the self. <clears throat> and he had a very interesting process called self-inquiry, where whenever there was a thought, the person would say to themselves, who had this thought? And of course, when they listened, something inside would say, me. And so then Ramana would follow by saying, who am I? The moment you ask, who am I? If you are fortunate, you experience the silence that penetrates everything. You, you experience a spaciousness, something that you cannot describe but is so there. 
what do you experience, which Ramana called the self, and he said the self is the same as God, is a field of awareness that sees everything all the time. It is aware of what is in the external world. It is aware of all the sensations of the inner body, and it is aware of all the activity that we call mind. If there wasn't something aware of mind, we would never know when the mind was talking or when it was quiet. The reason we are aware of it is because something is observing it. Just like you are aware of me because you're observing me in your Skype screen and vice versa. The difference between the source of our seeing, what Ramana called the self, and what we call mind, is that mind has a familiar voice. We're all aware when the mind is talking, but the seer never speaks. It doesn't utter a word. So if you hear a word, it isn't it. It's that which heard the word, not that which uttered the word. Why is this so important? Because that experience in 76 has over time allowed me to realize that I am not the changing process going on in the mind. I am not the clouds moving in the sky of my awareness. I am the sky. I am the background. And so over time, rather than relying on what I think, I rely on something that knows without knowing. It just knows without a knower. There isn't a personal identity. Thoughts arise from within. Awareness, the, the guidance that we receive free of charge, comes seemingly out of nothingness. It just all of a sudden shows up with total clarity. That guidance is what we call inspiration. It inspires us to look in the direction that life requires us to look so that we can see our life's curriculum and the path that is our life's journey. And so we are continually receiving guidance from an invisible realm which knows everything, sees everything, is everything. After a while, you begin to realize that that realm is never wrong. Now, some people say, oh, it's my intuition. Oh, I had a feeling. The reason we have different words, or they say I had an epiphany, is that you cannot describe the undescribable. And so we try to name it, but there is no name that actually works. But I'll share with you what I know. <clears throat> the body is a field of eyes. Most people think their eyes are situated in their cranium, in their head. And what we learned many years ago is that the physical eyes in the head can detect single photons of light. Now, a photon is invisible. It has no characteristics, no attributes. It is the unformed. 
And yet, what we see in the world has form. And so we are continually being guided <clears throat> by the invisible that allows everything to become visible. Let's take that a step further. What we now know is that this, the body has approximately 100 trillion cells. All of these cells have eyes. All of our cells have photoreceptors that are designed to detect and respond to photons of light. That means that we are continually responding to the invisible before it is rendered into visible. Why does that occur? That occurs so that we always meet life in the instance we call presence. How does that occur as an example? Let's take an animal like a bear. A bear in the summer, it has long hair, but then as summer begins to change into autumn, you notice that the skin of the bear begins to get thicker. <clears throat> it begins to grow more hair than it had in the summer. And then the seasons change, and one morning the, the bear wakes up and the snow is falling down, and it doesn't say, oh my gosh, I forgot to go to the store and get an overcoat. It doesn't need to buy an overcoat. It already is wearing an overcoat because life has prepared it in advance, so when the snowfall comes, the bear meets life in each moment with total congruence and coherence. The same is true of all living creatures, including plants. All of us are being guided in an invisible realm by light, the same light the Bible refers to as God and spiritual traditions referred to as consciousness or awareness. And that light is guiding every cell in the body, guiding it into what to do, when to do it, and to what degree. So because of that, there's nothing we can do to make things better and there's nothing we can do to make things worse. We are designed to meet life with all that we have in each moment. When we allow that, what we call awareness is optimal. And when awareness is optimal, it is curative. It allows us to see that which cannot be seen with the eyes and moves you in ways that you cannot even begin to imagine. I'll give you an example. The world is going through an unprecedented experience right now. It's not something that's happening in China that we're hearing about in the US or India or somewhere else. It's something that is occurring everywhere at the same time. What is profound about that is that everyone is having a direct experience. And the direct experience is when the rubber meets the road. That direct experience is the moment of ultimate clarity. People can talk about fear and theories and all of these different things. But it's only when you have the direct experience that one really knows what they're made of. And it's going on everywhere right now. What's interesting for me is that about two months ago, 
about 4.30 in the morning, I awoke with total clarity of what's going on right now. The next morning, I told my wife that this was going to be much bigger than anything we could ever imagine. I texted my children and said, don't plan any trips and so on. It's not going to be happening. And now I've been watching it. So this is not a personal thing. All of us have these things all the time. Sometime a year ago or more, something guided you to reach out to me. Whatever guided you to reach out to me, guided me to immediately respond with one word in capital letters. Yes. This is how we find ourselves here. It's miraculous. We've never met, but we have a bond. How did that occur? We didn't have to work at it. We didn't have to do anything. It, it was just effortless. That gives us a clue about the essence of life. That just as our bodies breathe easily, we're guided easily through all of these different terrains. And now is a very interesting time because we're getting an opportunity to experience thing, everything from our greatest trepidation and fear to the greatest silence we've ever experienced. We spend hours meditating hoping that the mind will be quiet. Now the world has stopped. We don't have to go into a cave to be alone. We are being told we must stay home in our own cave. We spent years dealing with the existential threat that we call climate change. But I sense that there has been a greatest, greater impact on climate change from what's occurring right now than what has occurred with all of our efforts. Because it's not about our doing, it's about stop doing. It's about allowing and noticing how the intelligence of life is working. So... This is an incredible time for all of us in that we are being forced to drive the car in the middle of the lane. We cannot be too close to the, to the sidewalk where the pedestrians are walking. We cannot be close to the middle of the lane where the other cars are coming. We are in a heightened state of awareness It's a wake up. It's our awakening. And this is a time for each of us to notice the things, not so much that we're looking for, but those things that are looking for us, that are entering our awareness free of charge and guiding us when to go out of the house, when to stay home, when to shop for food, where to go, and so on. Woo! That's a good beginning. Yes, Jacob. Jacob, this is what uh, I, I guess this is what you mean when you said that uh, uh, human beings are fundamentally guided by light. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. And you say the same thing. You know, you said before we started the interview, you mentioned God. And what did you say about God? I said that God helps us in every moment. Right. Another way of saying that is God, God is guiding us in every moment. 
And if you look at the Bible, it very clearly says that God is light. Boom. So if you look at the religious or spiritual text, they all say that. And if you look at the greatest scientists in the world, they use different words, but they say exactly that. That light is the fundamental energy from where life emerges. So we don't have to, we're not, the, the religious or spiritual text are not in opposition to science. They may read things in a different way, but they actually are converging on the exact same point. And, and then you realize we're not different, we're all the same. Yes, Jacob, definitely. Now, uh, I want to ask you a question on a different topic. Um, sure. What do you say to people who say that uh, wearing specs, wearing glasses are a permanent thing and we can't do anything anymore? Sometimes <clears throat> they are a permanent thing. <clears throat> because they are part of our journey allowing us to see life in a certain way each of us has awakenings in different ways my mother god bless her soul was diagnosed with cancer four times the first cancer was the deadliest cancer at the time i was just a young teenager and she was given a month to live. My mother lived another 50 years. She had her awakening through being confronted by one of the scariest things for us, cancer. And what she began to realize <clears throat> is that something inside her, for reasons we don't understand, is even more powerful than cancer. For me, I had an awakening having to do with my eyesight, and then I've had many awakenings since then. For you, something happened with your vision over the last year, and you all of a sudden uncovered something about the hidden potential within your humanity. So for some people, the awareness comes to them in the way it came to you or to me or to my mother. And for others, they may be wearing glasses because glasses are an important aspect of their discovery process not because they have to get rid of them, but because they're actually a gift for them. For people who have very severe vision issues, they don't look at their glasses as a hindrance, they look at their glasses as a, a God-sent gift. Sometimes glasses become another opportunity. <clears throat> which is an opportunity to see that there's another level of vision and seeing, but it doesn't always arise through the vehicle of eyesight. It can arise through the vehicle of anything. So it's not a matter of believing or disbelieving. Neither one of those, from my perspective, <clears throat> have any reality to them. It is what's in between that has the reality. Belief is virtual. Belief is an idea, a thought, a concept, a hypothesis, a postulate, a theory. But the word that means the opposite of belief is truth. That is ultimately what we're seeking, not belief, 
but truth. It's not a belief in God. It's an absolute knowing. That absolute knowing is truth beyond opinion. It's beyond anything that's of the mind. So for some people, because this is not the vehicle, they might say, that's impossible. <clears throat> and all they're really saying to you is, that isn't the vehicle that is chosen for me. That's all. You know, it's it's not... <clears throat> when someone says, this is not my vehicle, they're telling you the truth. Believe them. If you try to convince them, <clears throat> you will both end up in a power struggle because we can never convince anyone that requires convincing. And yet, if they require no convincing, very few words go a very long way. Uh, Jacob, in the book, you have mentioned that uh, there is a connection between uh, childhood experiences and uh, eyesight problems. I really think yeah. uh, it has... The Many people don't know about that. Can you explain that? Yeah. <clears throat> Let's begin with the fact that the experiences in our life, just like our genetics, impact us. They impact how we see the world, how we respond to the world. And how we see the world, I'm not just talking about mentally, but I'm talking about physiologically. And that's very important, but I want to make it even bigger <clears throat> because <clears throat> the experiences of our lifetime, when you look at your parents, if you were to have a deep conversation you might find that they had very similar experiences. And if they speak to their parents, they might find that they also had very similar experiences. So what I'm sharing with you is our childhood experiences did not, did not originate in our childhood. They have been part of our lineage for tens of thousands, if not millions of generations, we do not know their origin. They are part of our life's journey and they mold us. In the process of noticing how we are impacted by our experiences, the possibility exists that something can open. Not only for us, but it can also open for our ancestors simultaneously. Jesus in the Bible was quoted as saying, the truth shall set you free. In understanding our childhood experiences, and then noticing that our parents had similar experiences and that their parents had similar experiences, we begin to realize that our parents are not the fault of our problems. I'm not this way because my father did this or my mother did this or they didn't share this or we, be we begin to understand ourselves that each of us is always at our maximum potential. Each of us is always responding to everything that's going on in the best possible way possible. Why is that important? When we realize that we are always responding in the best way that we can, and that occurs without us naturally, a lot of the trying, the effort, the emotional issues begin to loosen their grip on us. And that's when things begin to open. Why do they open? Not because of what we do, but because of what we see. 
And the change occurs not because we've done something to change, but because we've come to unconditionally accept the person we have always been. Your eyesight is not a problem. It is a fact. When we accept it as a fact, it disappears as a problem and becomes the path toward our solution. And so awareness becomes curative as we begin to, to see our life in different ways. And um, one thing that I've come to see is I'm exactly the same person now I was when I was an infant. In fact, I didn't have hair then and I don't have now. But literally, that same sweetness that each of us had as an infant, as a small child, that's essentially who we are. And that's essentially who we are our whole life. And when we begin to rediscover this, that's when things begin to sweeten. However, I should also say that our awakening, what sometimes is called enlightenment or delightenment, as I like to call it, is not the absence of problems. It's the acceptance of problems. Uh, none of us is going to live forever. None of us will go through life without getting sick many times. None of us will go through life without fear, without losing a loved one or a great love or losing our money. And none of us are happy when these things occur. And all of us will experience the mind worrying and all of us will experience our body shaking when fear is there. We do not create the fear. The fear is a beautiful reflection that allows us to awaken to something that needs to be seen. I guess what I'm saying is there's nothing wrong with us. There's nothing to fix. Your eyes don't require fixing. They are in fact what brought us together. Wow, what a miracle. So, yeah. Yes, Jacob. That's so interesting. Um, I want to ask you a question on a physical level. So, sure. uh, do you think that uh, wearing glasses actually contribute to the progression of uh, poor vision? Yes and no. Yes, in that most of us are given glasses and we're not directed to just wear them when we need them. We're not, we are not told that while you can see detail with your glasses, you will not be able to feel as much. But without your glasses, you will see less detail, but you will actually feel and see more. But it's in an invisible realm. So if we wear them all the time, we become adjusted to them. We become habituated to them. And then they stopped having a benefit. For instance, if you've ever had a fever, Maybe your mother gave you an aspirin to reduce the fever, and it works beautifully. But if you take an aspirin every day of your life, when you have a fever, the aspirin may not work. So if you're wearing the glasses all the time, after a while, they stop working. So you need stronger ones. And because of that, it creates a progression. Let's look at the other side. 
you wore glasses for years and you saw your own eyes progress. But it was your vision that actually became the path for your life to move in a different direction. So on one level, the problem progressed. And on another level, as the Chinese say, crisis leads to opportunity or crisis means opportunity. The problem became the path to the solution. So both things are true. And I think it's important not to see things as something is wrong. It's just for each of us, different things become the the light that illuminates our journey. Jacob, many people nowadays are going for a uh, laser surgery, eye laser surgery. What are your thoughts on that? For some people, LASIK surgery is an absolute miracle, just like cataract surgery. Someone can't see, and they do a little 15-minute procedure and remove the cataract, and their whole life changes. Or they have a LASIK procedure, maybe they have very severe myopia, and all of a sudden, for the first time, they can see. And so for many people, it's a miraculous process. For others, it becomes a source of a problem because sometimes when they do this, even though you may immediately have clear eyesight, at night you might notice reflections that are very disturbing. <clears throat> a nearsighted person has difficulty seeing far, but has great ease usually seeing up close. When you do LASIK surgery, you may be able to clear their vision at distance, but then reading becomes more difficult. So there's a give and a take with everything. <clears throat> everything has a purpose, excuse me. <clears throat> everything has a purpose and you just have to allow yourself to be guided. When does it work? When do I use a homeopathic remedy? And when do I require an antibiotic? When will rest heal an injury? And when is surgery required? It's not one or the other. It's both. It's just a matter of when. Jacob, you have mentioned that uh... Uh, eye surgery is like a, like something to mask the real problem behind ourselves, right? You mean eyesight issues? Uh, actually, uh, making the eye surgery, laser eye surgery, is like masking the real issue behind our eyesight. Instead of uh, following the what our eyesight is going to tell us, we are just masking the problem. Is that correct? Well... What the body does when we encounter something we don't understand is it tries to create a compensation to create ease, to ease our discomfort, our fear. And so these compensations, whether they are internal thoughts or external actions, they have a similar impact. They they, um, you could say, put off the clarity until the moment is right for us to see it. You see, you cannot know something before you know it. And once you know it, you don't need to be reminded of it again. So, what I notice in our lives is we are continually compensating for things in the external world and internal world. 
until an awareness occurs, an epiphany, a miracle, if you will, where we realize that what we thought was a problem is actually our solution. But it isn't because we were in denial. It was because it wasn't supposed to occur until this instance. So all of these things that we're involved in are actually part of our journey. Uh, Jacob, you have said that uh, you have treated your mother's uh, blindness in the book. Uh, can you say uh, about that? Oh, yeah, 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 my mother, right. My mother had a condition called uh, optic nerve, ischemic optic neuropathy. Ischemic means that the blood flow stopped to the eye, to the optic nerve, and the optic nerve just didn't have any nourishment, so it just started to die. And it basically caused her to go blind for about nine months. I then treated her with certain wavelengths of light that we perceive as color. We would perceive this wavelength as turquoise, blue-green. I just had a feeling to do this. I wanted to do this from the beginning, but you know, in your own family, you're never an expert. So my father wouldn't allow me to treat my mother. She went to every expert and all of them said the same thing. There's nothing you can do, Mrs. Lieberman. So my father then said it would be okay. And I had her look at a turquoise light for 20 minutes, once or twice a day. Four days after she began, she was able to see a big number, a number that was maybe this, a foot, maybe 12 inches big, she could see it at four feet away and to recognize it. Every day it improved a little bit. On the 10th or 11th day, her depression had lifted. <clears throat> and in 20 days, she was reading a letter that was three inches at 20 feet away. What was interesting about this is that many years later, about four, 15 years later, when I wrote my first book, Light Medicine of the Future, which is where I shared this story in the beginning of the book, I asked, I spoke to my mother so I would remember all the details. And she said, you know, I forgot to tell you something. Not only did the eye that was blind begin to see again, but the other eye also improved. I said, really, I didn't know this. She said, I didn't tell you, but I had the same condition in the other eye 15 years, I think, before. And the vision in that eye mostly came back, but some of it never came back. <clears throat> and when you did this treatment, that eye also improved. And what was so terrifying about it for me was that her mother, my grandmother, had the same condition in both eyes, lost the eyesight in both eyes, <clears throat> and was legally blind at the end of her life. And that's why my mother was so scared. So we never know how little miracles will show up. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was my introduction, not my first introduction, but my most significant introduction into the field of using light and color as a therapeutic tool. Uh, Jacob, could you talk more about uh, color therapy? About color therapy, sure. Essentially, the body is a living photo cell. <clears throat> it's just like a photovoltaic cell on a building that when sun impacts it, it collects energy and then it can provide electricity and power for the building. 
all of the cells of the body are little photovoltaic cells. They live on light. They take in light and that's what causes them to be able to accomplish everything that they do. The, so every cell in the body is light dependent. Now light is invisible. We experience brightness, which is a perceptual phenomenon. And we also experience the different portions of the spectrum of energy we call light. And we experience those as color. We say, oh, this is the color red, this is the color blue. Each of the wavelengths that we perceive as color has different impact upon us. <clears throat> part of it is just a physiological impact and part of it is a psycho-emotional impact. <clears throat> Each of us likes certain colors and dislikes others because the colors we like are related to experiences that we have fond memories of. The colors we dislike have to do with experiences that are we're not quite able to embrace certain portions of the spectrum like the ultraviolet trigger the synthesis of vitamin D. Vitamin D is one of the most important vitamins we have. In fact, all of the diseases of civilization, heart disease, diabetes, uh, Alzheimer's, osteoporosis, macular degeneration, and cancer, are all related to vitamin D deficiency because we've become an indoor culture. So sunlight is critical to health. So the ultraviolet has to do with that. Then there's a part called the red end of the spectrum or the near infrared. 50% of the energy of the sun is in the red and near infrared range. Red and near infrared light causes the a certain part of the cell of the body uh, to create ATP, to create energy that the cell uses for everything from creating DNA and RNA to cell division to the immune function and so on. And so light is incredibly potent. We cannot live without it, just like a plant requires light. So when we talk about chromotherapy or color therapy, we're talking about the impact that each portion of the spectrum has upon the body. Now in the past, people thought this was just some sort of metaphysical practice that had no scientific basis. In fact, one of the maybe the most well-known pioneer in color therapy was uh, an Indian man named Dinshaw P. Gadiali, and he developed a very elaborate system of color therapy. So um, color therapy has been around for a long time. Now science realizes that it's not just some spiritual idea. It's scientific fact. All of our cells are guided by light. Every portion of the spectrum has a different impact upon us. So we need to get a daily minimum requirement of sunlight. We all need to get outside every day for 20, 30 minutes at least. If you're taking a walk, if possible, take off your shirt. Let the sunlight hit big portions of the body and it will enhance your health and wellness dramatically. Colors you can use to accomplish many different things um, and the approach of using color to help us become more receptive to the fullness of life is something that I have contributed to this field um, through my own discoveries that 
that as we become comfortable with all the colors, <clears throat> taking them in, we begin to become more comfortable with all the things in life. And so people can do this at home using color therapy kits and so on. If they go to my website, they'll notice a kit called the Spectral Receptivity System, which is a, a set of 13 very simple glasses where I provide a protocol where people can use a very systematic way using this at home um, to help their overall health and wellness. Yes, Jacob, I also checked out your uh, kit. Uh, it was awesome. And uh, uh -huh. uh, Jacob, you are the first person I have seen talking about the bad effects of sunglasses. Can you say that to the audience? Yeah, again, are sunglasses bad? No, and yes, everything has a purpose. Water is very, very good. And everyone should drink water every day. But if you drank uh, five gallons of water every day, you might find it will make you terribly sick. Sunglasses are the same way. Sunglasses were initially developed for pilots who were flying planes and sometimes had to fly directly into the sun and they couldn't see. The glasses were made to reduce the quantity of light so that it would allow them to see. And then it was used for people skiing down a mountain and for fishermen on the ocean to reduce the quantity of light. The purpose of sunglasses initial wasn't to change the balance of sunlight to allow more red or less blue or anything like that. It was just to reduce the amount of light. So if you're using sunglasses in an exceedingly bright day when you're driving into the sun, that's no, no problem with that. But if you're putting on sunglasses every time you go outside, it's going to negatively impact you. Why? I mentioned a few moments ago that we are living photo cells that must have light in order to function. It is, it is the perfect fuel for the running of our bodies. So we cannot live without sunlight. When we start, and, and most of that sunlight reaches us through our eyes. And it's not related to seeing, it's related to basically illuminating every aspect of our physiology and neurology about what time of the day is it, what time of the year is it, so we're synchronized with Mother Nature. When you limit that light dramatically or change the balance of, the, of nature's sunlight, <clears throat> it's like putting petrol in your car that is the wrong octane. The engine just doesn't function as efficiently. So sunlight, again, like everything else, has its benefit. I mean, uh, sunglasses ha have benefits if used for certain purposes. The other thing is some people are more sensitive to light than others. I never use sunglasses. Not because I'm against sunglasses. I just don't need them. My eyes, even though I have light blue eyes, can deal with very high levels of light with no problem. <clears throat> so for me, I just don't need them. I don't wear them. But someone else may find that it makes it easier for them. Jacob, uh, there is a belief that uh, uh, as we age, our eyesight gets weaker. Is it truth or a myth? Because... Uh, uh, vision is not completely based on physical aspect, right? Right. Um, everything in the body <clears throat> is just like a car. If you drive a car, as it gets older, uh, it, it, it makes little noises that it didn't make in the beginning. Sometimes things break down. 
The body is just like that, whether you're talking about the eyes, the ears, the teeth, everything else. Over time, the physical machine, just like a mechanical machine, begins to break down. The driver of the physical machine is a little different in that the driver is the awareness. One gets older and we call it aging. The other one gets wiser and we call it saging. You become a sage, a wise person. A wise person can see more when they look less. So on one level, the physical parts of the eyes may notice less, but the inner vision is still able to see. It may not understand how it sees, but it is guided and so that it sees even what it can't see. Yes, Jacob. Jacob, uh, are our phones ruining our eyesight? Weapons of mass distraction. Yes and no. Yes, in that a hundred years ago, we didn't have televisions. We didn't have telephones, uh, cell phones. Hundred and twenty years ago, most of us worked outside. All day long, we were in the sunlight. Nobody wore sunglasses. There weren't sunglasses. The eyes were designed to see things far away. Most people were working more and reading less. <clears throat> We've come from an outdoor culture to an indoor culture. From natural daylight to artificial light, from seeing far away to reading books, from reading books to reading computers, from reading computers to reading handheld devices. From handheld devices, we've gone down to cell phones. Each time the field is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and being compacted with more and more and more. So there is a lot more in a lot less space. If you took too many creatures and you put them into a small space, they would start to cannibalize each other. They would become emotionally unstable. If you put too much information, into a small space, it makes it hard to breathe. It makes it hard to process. So what we know is that any confinement of vision causes the vision system to adapt and to compensate by confining itself. So the more you confine it to a smaller space, the more it adjusts to confine to the demand of the culture. So right now, nearsightedness, astigmatism, it's the biggest health epidemic in the world. And it is progressing very, 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 very quickly. Cell phones on another level are a wonderful gift, but we have to remember to look away that uh, you know it's okay to use your phone to make a call or maybe to quickly check your email, but you don't wanna be reading a book on your cell phone. And when you're sitting in a bus uh, going somewhere, you don't want to have your eyes focused on this little box the entire time. It's much nicer to look at someone else's eyes and to have social contact. So, Right now, I'm looking at you through a large monitor, a 34-inch monitor. But behind the monitor, 
is a large window. It's four feet by eight feet with total unobstructed views all the way to the ocean. So natural light is coming in all the time. So while I'm looking at a monitor, I'm continually also gazing away. We need to remember that if we're going to look at our cell phones, take time to look away. Take time to close the eyes. Take time to breathe. It's just common sense or maybe uncommon sense. Jacob, uh, can you share some basic tips for our audience to improve eyesight? To improve eyesight. Remove your glasses when you don't need them. Do simple experiments. Nobody needs their glasses to see the food on their plate. So remove your glasses every time you're eating. When someone goes to use the toilet, they don't need their glasses. Leave them outside. If you're taking a little walk around your house, even if you don't see very well, you're not going to fall over a rock. You're familiar with the area. Keep experimenting first in the most safe place without your glasses. See what it feels like. Initially, you'll notice, oh, things are blurry. But then you begin to notice that when things are blurry, you start getting a little nervous because you feel less in control. All of a sudden, you realize that you have a fear of being out of control or that you have a need to always be in control. Nothing wrong with either one of those, but good to discover. It, it, it allows you to see clearly something about yourself. So in removing your glasses, you begin to see a different world that you do not see with your glasses on. So you use, uh, you create experiments to discover, uncover aspects of your inner life and your inner terrain. Notice all the feelings that come up, the physical sensations. Be with them as long as you're comfortable. When you're not comfortable, put your glasses back on. Experiment a little while later. Close your eyes whenever you're going to, to the toilet. Close your eyes and just breathe without the glasses on. Let your, give your nose and your ears and your eyes a break. Rub your nose. Rub around your eyes. Rub your ears. Give, give yourself a, a chance to notice things about life that you may not notice with your glasses on. And then make that part of your protocol. If you like to take a walk, put your glasses in your pocket and see what happens when you walk without them. Is it true that you're going to have an accident? Or is it true that you actually see much more than you're even aware of? These are all things that you discover about yourself. And over time, you regain a confidence that you had previously lost. Jacob, uh, can you talk about lens reduction therapy? Because I think it has a high potential. Yeah. So whenever we get glasses, they always give us stronger glasses. So the question is, what happens when you all of a sudden get something that's weaker? Not a lot weaker, just a little bit weaker. Most people find that when they weaken their glasses just a little bit, they can still see clearly. It's just softer. And, and within a very short period of time, they actually get comfortable seeing in this new way. They feel quite comfortable. And when they are totally comfortable, 
Maybe they weaken them again. One increment of power, two in not too much. Not so much that you say, I can't see. Just enough that it like creates a little bit of yoga for the mind, the brain, the eyes. It creates a an expansion. I think that's a very powerful practice that people can do. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are many places where people can buy glasses online very inexpensively. And they send them to you. It costs very, very little. And for you to experiment. Jacob, you are specialized in children and adolescents learning difficulties. Do you see any connection between uh, uh, learning and vision? Sure. Did you ever try to read with your eyes closed? It doesn't work very well. Um, when you're paying attention, how do you know somebody's paying attention to you? It isn't because they put their ear this way. It's because they're looking at you. So looking and attention are the same process. And attention, which is a, a probably not the best word, is a word for presence. So learning occurs with presence. Eyes are inseparable from presence. So there is no way to separate one's learning ability from one's vision. This is why when people know something, they say, I see. Seeing and knowing are the same thing. And so when I was in practice many years ago, that's what I did. I worked with children who had attentional difficulties or who they said had difficulties learning. Most of the time, these children were geniuses. They just learned in a different way. We have to recognize that we all learn in a different way that's natural for us. You mentioned in the beginning that I had several doctorates. What you didn't mention is that I had reading and learning problems my whole life. And I thought I was stupid. It's just that I learned in a different way. I didn't learn by reading books. I learned by having direct experience. So we have to respect that each of us has a different way that's natural for us. Jacob, uh, now our subscriber, uh, Phil W, has uh, some questions to you. Yeah. Uh, he's asking that... Uh, the usage of specific wavelengths like uh, red and uh, near infrared uh, for treating uh, eye related ailments, but you have covered it before. So I'm moving to the next question. Is that okay? But uh, let me make a response about that. <clears throat> red and near infrared are being used to treat a whole variety of vision issues. <clears throat> you have to have the right wavelengths of light. And for the eyes, it's done very short periods of time. It's often done with the eyes closed, maybe for two minutes or three minutes maximum, maybe once or twice a week. So the use of red and near infrared, too little doesn't work so well and too much doesn't work so well. You have to be right in the middle. Uh, Jacob, he also asked regarding the LED panels like Zoom. Right. You mean LED panels of lights? Yes, the most of the uh, photobiomodulation, which is the use of red and near infrared light, is done with LED panels <clears throat> that usually combine red light and near infrared light, depending on what you're looking to do. Uh, Jacob, his next question is, uh... Uh, is sun gazing good for cataracts and other eye diseases? I don't think so. Um, sun gazing is a lovely practice, uh, which is very nice at sunset when the sun is going down. 
and for a short period of time at sunrise. Uh, this idea of people sun gazing for 30 to 40 minutes in the middle of the day, we've evolved away from these practices. And I have not found that those practices for humans today <clears throat> are actually beneficial. We're not designed to look directly into the sun. We're designed to be outdoors and to let natural sunlight enter the eyes and enter the body. Everything is moderation, just like drinking water. So the whole idea of doing this technique to fix this problem, I think people have a tendency to, to go a little bit overboard with these things. Jacob, his question, his last question is, uh, how do you feel about eye exercises? Are they any better from eye relaxation? You know, humans are addicted to exercise, but no animal exercises. You don't ever see animals going to exercise classes. They walk, sometimes they run, but they don't run for the sake of running. They run if something is chasing them or if they're chasing something. Other than that, they walk or they rest or they swim or they fly. So in terms of vision, it's not so much about doing more, it's more associated with doing less. The muscles of the eyes are a hundred times stronger than they need to be from birth. <clears throat> vision has nothing to do with strengthening muscles. It has to do with fine tuning awareness. Certain vision training exercises are beneficial because they allow us to see something. They're not beneficial because they cause us to do calisthenic exercises, which is something different. Jacob, in the Luminous Life, you have written about walking meditation. Can you say that to the audience? Sure. When I walk, for instance, first of all, I notice that most of us, when we walk, we look down. And so I first notice how the body habitually responds. And in noticing that, my awareness pulls me so that the eyes are looking <coughs> straight ahead. Now I notice when the eyes are looking straight ahead, the head position changes. When the head position changes, the neck and the spine change. When that changes, the whole walking pattern changes. We literally become taller, taller. So as I walk, eyes are open and once I begin to notice that I'm looking straight then the next thing that I find myself is that I'm looking at nothing so rather than looking at something I just look into empty space and when I look into empty space, something in the whole body begins to relax. And the vision actually begins to change. Sometimes it's visibly improves. Another thing that I do while I'm walking is when I'm walking up the hill, I walk straight. And when I'm walking down the hill, I turn around and walk backwards. And so I'm continually changing whether I'm walking forwards or backwards so that I can allow my eyes, the eyes in my feet to begin to see for me. I keep changing things 
and allowing my body to adjust to changes. Jacob, is it related to open focus? Yeah, yeah. Open focus for me is the process of looking at nothing and just noticing what you see when you look at nothing. Because most of the time we're looking for something and missing everything we're not looking for. But when we begin to just focus on nothing, many things become clear that were not clear before. Jacob, would you like to issue a seven day challenge to our subscribers? Yeah. If you're an eyeglass wearer, start doing an experiment where you leave your glasses off, maybe for a minute, a few different times of the day, and you notice how that feels. And maybe each day you extend it one more minute just to see what happens. And then after the seven days, continue the experiment and see where it takes you to keep noticing. If you wear hearing aids, do the same thing. See what happens if you leave them out for a little while. Just notice what the silence, what information is coming to you from the silence. Whatever is your habitual, the habitual way in which you live, try something a little different. Everyone sits down to eat. Everyone has a, a dominant hand they eat with. Want to try a seven day challenge? Each meal, eat with the opposite hand, just for a short period of time to see what it looks like. I'll give you an example. I had shoulder surgery. Tomorrow will be five weeks. And uh, initially, uh, I had to eat with my left hand. I had surgery on a Tuesday early in the morning. That evening, my wife and I, we were on another island. We went out to dinner to a, a sushi restaurant. And of course, in a sushi restaurant, you eat with chopsticks. Now, I'm pretty good with chopsticks with my right hand, but I've never eaten with chopsticks with my left hand. Lo and behold, maybe the food was delicious, or maybe I have skills that I didn't even know about, but I ate the whole meal with chopsticks with my left hand, and I did it really, really well. What a powerful experiment. Here for 45 minutes while we're eating or an hour, all of a sudden, <clears throat> all the neurons in my brain are changing direction and I'm growing new brain cells that have to do with eating with my left hand. In that hour, my brain grew significantly. So a seven day challenge is an opportunity to experiment, which means you don't know where it's going to take you or what the result will be. But if you notice that it is opening up some part of yourself, be it your eyes, your ears, your non-dominant hand, or walking in a different way. If you find that it keeps opening up part of you, keep experimenting. And every Monday, start a new seven-day challenge. Awesome, Jacob. Uh, before we go, can you share again, uh, where can people connect with you? Sure. Um, they can visit uh, the website, which is jacoblieberman.org, O-R-G. They can follow me on Facebook. They can go to Google and Google my name, or they can go to YouTube and they'll see all kinds of videos and so on. Um, and um, hopefully this has inspired uh, something for them uh, about a new opportunity. Uh, Jacob, before we leave, I want to share to the audience how I feel about you. Uh, yes. So the first time I have uh, discovered you, 
uh, from a guy who was talking about you in a talk show. So I was so interested that I began searching you on Google. And then I first bought your book, uh, Take Off Your Glasses and Read. And, uh -huh. and that's it. Uh, from the moment I bought this book, I was so hooked with your... Uh, I don't know what to say, but something I got so attracted to you that we had an opportunity to talk with you. Um, you have recommended my sister and me to go to follow the lens reduction therapy. And yeah. from then, my sight was from, uh, from that moment, my sight went from minus four to minus three, which I'm mm -hmm. wearing now, which I can see crystal clear without any difficulties. It all mm. began with you and uh, in our family also, we also talk about you every single day and even uh, uh, my grandmother and everyone talk about you. We don't know, but <laughs> we, <laughs> we, talk, we have a special connection with you. So thanks uh -huh. uh, for your knowledge and your wisdom and uh, thanks for being so uh, wonderful. Please uh, send my love to your entire family and tell them that they just made my day. Thanks, uh, Jacob, for coming to the show. Have a wonderful day. We'll talk soon. I can't wait for the next time. Yeah, subscribe to BNS Goku Great.